Welcome everyone to Drone Ecologies, a workshop which aims to explore the opportunities and risks of aerial monitoring uh, for biodiversity conservation through interdisciplinary exchange and dialogue. And we're really delighted you could join us today from all across the UK and from all around the world, in fact. Uh, we've got participants joining us today from Mexico, from the USA, from Indonesia, Spain and Norway. So please do introduce yourselves in the chat. So uh, my name is Naomi Milner. I'm a senior lecturer in human geography here at the University of Bristol. And my work is mainly in the interdisciplinary subdiscipline of political ecology, which for those of you who haven't come across it before, looks at the political dimensions of nature and environments, also the environmental and ecological dimensions of global politics. Uh, with a particular focus on conservation politics in Latin America, I've been involved in a number of interdisciplinary projects in, um, in forest and biodiversity conservation over the past decade, which has led to my enthusiasm for and commitment to interdisciplinary um, dialogues like this, as well as to my current work on drones and monitoring technologies. And as one of the organisers of the conference, along with my colleagues Monica Amador and Ben Newport here at Bristol, I'm going to give a uh, a brief introduction to the ideas and methodologies behind this workshop, first of all. Uh, but to begin, I'm going to give just a few points of housekeeping to start us off. If I can. So, first of all, please do keep your microphones turned off during the presentations. Um, this is just to prevent any kind of interference while we're listening to them. Um, obviously, if you come to share a comment, switch them on. Uh, we've asked that you switch your um, your name to your full name. This is just so we know who's speaking. And also when we come to divide people up into the discussion groups so we know who's in the room. Please turn your camera off during the actual presentations and talks. Um, this is just bandwidth issues really. But do consider turning your video on unless you've got an issue with connection during open discussion and Q&A, so it actually feels like uh, we're a group of people in the room. And it's a shame that we're not a group of people in the room, unfortunately, um, but we do hope to have some follow-up events where we'll be able to, to get some of us together physically and in person. So this is a Zoom um, chat setup. Do feel free to share comments and questions live in the chat box throughout the event. We've kept this to a relatively small number of people, which means that we can probably bear with that obviously bear in mind the number of people in the room so maybe give space to others to speak but do keep that chat going throughout the day and feel free to live respond as a panelist or audience member rather than necessarily always waiting for the moments of dialogue and that will help keep it feeling interactive during the um, panels and talks if you want to ask a question you could use the raising your hand function or you can share your question um, in the chat and our team will collate the questions for each panel. And also just as a note, we have simultaneous translation today, Spanish and English from 2 to 6 p.m. to enable some of our colleagues from the Americas to participate more fully. So just to give instructions for that, if you should leave and rejoin, you'll need to note this later on. There will later on appear an icon at the bottom of your screen, that globe icon there for interpretation. And when you click on that icon, you'll need to choose the language of your choice. If you don't do that, it will be difficult to follow what's happening. So you'll need to click either English or Spanish to choose your language of choice. And then there'll be live translation for you as we go along. So my story with drones really began in the Maya biosphere in reserve in Guatemala, about which we're going to hear a bit more today. And the Maya biosphere reserve is a place of thick, humid forests and dense canopies, which today is a place of both great deforestation and one of the world leading examples of mahogany conservation, which is a protected species alongside other species. And it's specifically a world leading example of uh, community led conservation. So here rural communities have long been extracting timber and non timber products to live. But for the last 25 years, this has taken place according to international guidelines for sustainable community forestry, which has allowed rural communities to raise themselves above the poverty line 
while also allowing the forests themselves to regenerate. And after working there for several years on an interdisciplinary project that was looking at the effectiveness of community forestry as a mode of doing things economically, ecologically and so on, I was introduced to drones by communities who were using them to monitor their own conservation and to improve it. And this was a bit of a shock to me because as a social scientist, at first sight, I associated drones with the geographies of monitoring, control and surveillance I knew had also been part of international conservation programmes in Guatemala, as in other national parks in Latin America, Africa, India and elsewhere. And we'll hear more about that tomorrow. What some presenters will use the language green securitization tomorrow to describe the way that conservation is being used to push forward other agendas with security and control. The way that conservation is being used sometimes as a kind of green screen so that international agendas approve and stand by, um, but meanwhile new kinds of borders, new kinds of military interventions and new kinds of surveillance are approved, especially in kind of already conflicted areas. Only here, the surprising thing was that it was actually small, quite impoverished communities that were using the drones. And they had learned to use them from indigenous groups in Panama, through collaborations with the FAO and other UN organisations. And they were producing information with drones that were being used to debunk claims that they weren't doing an effective job of conservation. And this was to contest a rival plan presented by a US archaeologist in the early 2000s to convert those forests into a kind of eco park. Uh, a proposal that was initially overturned back then in the early 2000s, but which has re required continuous efforts ever since to contest. And that's partly why these groups have set up what they call a monitoring network using drones, partly to improve the conservation that they do and partly to defend their rights to be there. So at the same time as I was in Guatemala, my colleagues Laura Sauls and Jennifer Define, who are going to present later today, were also working in the reserve. And between us, we followed the different ways that technology has been a really important way um, of maintaining rights and land tenure, as well as effective conservation. On the flip side, some of our other colleagues have been looking at the ways that those same technologies have been used to displace communities and put them at risk. So for me, these kind of different studies raised a really important point, which many others in this room share, and that's that technology and that monitoring technologies in particular can be crucially important in enabling a good and effective conservation, enabling communities to defend their rights to land or livelihoods in rural areas and to meeting global sustainability goals. On the other hand, as technologies associated with surveillance, control, and war imaginaries, they bring new risks and power dynamics into the everyday activities of conservation organisations and rural communities in biodiverse areas, which may already be shaped by long histories of conflict or dispossession. So this workshop wants to bring together understandings on a number of fronts and shaped by a number of different disciplines. And this knowledge that we're bringing together is both practical and academic. We've got representatives here from a range of disciplines, but also from conservation organisations and practices. What we want to do is to share understandings of the opportunities and risks of drones in biodiversity conservation and set an agenda for future interdisciplinary work that supports state of the art, sustainable and equitable practices. Drones are extremely exciting technologies is the starting point of this dialogue and the how of doing them really matters. And so to do this, we've identified five key themes which you'll have come across in our literature, which the different sessions will open up um, through different dialogues, which we hope will continue after the event. The first is technicalities. What can drones do in biodiversity conservation? The second, rights and communities, wants to ask how communities can be used, sorry, how drones can be used to support the rights of rural communities. That question of drones and green securitization looks at when and where and how monitoring becomes surveillance. The question of ethics and protocols thinks about what best practices might be to ensure that drones are used to promote environmental justice rather than control. 
And then this question of spatial imaginaries of drones draws on the, the work of artists and um, arts academics to think about what visualities drones enable and how these might play into geographies of control and surveillance, but also resistance. So today we're going to focus particularly on that, the themes of technicalities, rights uh, and communities, as well as ethics and protocols. And then tomorrow we're going to zoom in more on that question of green securitization and spatial imaginaries. Here's just a brief overview of the day. We're now in the, the welcome session and we're going to move swiftly into a lunchtime plenary panel chaired by Ben Newport. We'll take a break. And then we have a paper session that's going to lead directly from that panel of thinking in a more applied way about how drones can be used uh, to be to be made to work for communities and for wildlife. And then we have a talk uh, from two experts in the Americas uh, who are speaking to us from Mexico today on community drones, on how drones have been used to strengthen biocultural um, conservation. And then we'll have a breakout activity looking at the implications of this for writing a policy briefing. So just to mention that a number of people have, have been involved in putting this together. So my colleagues Ben and Monica have been part of this since the beginning and we're also extremely grateful to Vicky Jones and the Cabot Institute who are helping put this on today. Also helping to run the event are our five graduate uh, reporters who are all masters and PhD students who are working on themes related to the day. Uh, they're interested in these themes in their own terms, but they're helping us to report on the event from different points of view and are helping on the technical side as well. So we're really grateful for their support and you'll see them appear at different points during the event. One of the things that they're helping us to do is also to build a visual record of the day, uh, which we'll be looking at at different points in the day. So I'd like to invite Juan now to share the Mural link. Mural is a kind of um, noteboard type software that we'll be using to keep a record of what happens in the conversation at different points. So we'd like to invite all participants, different people learn and interact in different ways. You might want to just sit back and listen to the talks. You might want to keep your own notes on paper. But if you're someone who gets a lot from talks by interacting in a visual way, please do help us populate our mural during the different sessions and keep a record of where the exciting conversations and the important debates and the disagreements were. So if you click on the link that should probably appear shortly in the chat, uh, you'll be able to access the mural and start inputting in the next session. Finally, just to mention about what to expect after the event, as we've mentioned, we are recording today um, and we hope to release most of the sessions publicly. Just we wanted to keep this a fairly small workshop to be able to have proper dialogue over the two days. But of course, there are other people who are going to be interested in these events. So we're going to be um, making a nice web page with the talks to be able to release to a wider audience and public. Um, in the weeks that come. So if you don't want your talk uh, released and you haven't told us already, make sure you let us know which parts need to be redacted and so on. But that's one thing we'll be doing after the event. We're talking to the Digital Ecologies Working Group about writing that up as a blog post, probably elsewhere as well. Out of the ethics session, we're hoping to write policy briefing, thinking particularly about the use of drone technologies by conservation practitioners and organisations. And if you'd like to be involved in the actual authoring of that briefing, please contact myself or Chris after today. And then finally, as I've mentioned in the emails, we're also hoping to release a special issue, bringing together some of the, the kind of state of the art work that's emerging across the disciplines in this area. So watch this space, but also do let me know if you're interested in that. And finally, just wanted to share a few points. This is really an interdisciplinary event and there are people in the room from across the board. We've got artists in the room, conservation practitioners, engineers, human geographers, cultural geographers, humanities and literary experts, all sorts of people in the room. And I definitely haven't covered them all. And it's really exciting to me to be in a room with such uh, different backgrounds, such a rich array of expertise. But one of the things 
that will be challenging in our conversations is that we don't all share a common language. And that's also what makes these conversations so rich, but we'd like to really invite everyone to consider the language they use when they're sharing their understanding or asking their questions, especially around this, this use of jargon. We don't want to, to avoid it altogether because sometimes jargon is necessary to get across a technical or conceptual point. But please do explain the points that you would like to make and rather than assuming that everyone in the room will necessarily know what you want to talk about or what your discipline uh, thinks about that idea. And where possible, especially when you're explaining a, a bigger idea, do explain your methodology or assumptions that you're making when you've come up with a, a particular point as well. And that will make it more possible, especially in the small group chats, to have a rich and deep conversation rather than talking across purposes. And then those, those other kind of more obvious ethos questions apply, being curious, asking questions, being open to change our minds, following up connections and conversations will all contribute to meaning that this is a meaningful dialogue that has long lasting effects rather than a surface level crisscross kind of conversation. So really looking forward to getting to know people in the room and hearing from you all. And thanks so much for making the time in your July um, to be here today. Now I'm going to pass over to Ben, um, who's going to chair. Ben is a PhD student here at Geography, an interdisciplinary student who studies the use of drones in Borneo. And he's going to chair our plenary panel, which involves four experts using drones in biodiversity conservation. Uh, and the plenary panel is entitled Using Drones in Biodiversity Conservation, Risks, Opportunities and Futures. Over to you, Ben, and to the panel. Hello, thank you everybody uh, for coming and welcome, as Naomi said, to the first plenary panel on using drones in biodiversity conservation. Um, my name is Ben Newport and just to briefly introduce myself, although Naomi's already done so, um, I am an interdisciplinary PhD student here at the School of Geographical Sciences in Bristol, um, supervised by Naomi and also Joe House and then by TC Hales in Cardiff. My research investigates the use of, of lightweight consumer grade drones for forest management and monitoring in Borneo. Um, I'm interested in, in how drones have been utilised for forest conservation, the various approaches that forest actors take in adopting such technologies, and the different analytical capacities that are required by different user groups. Uh, included in my research are questions around the drivers and barriers to implementing drone methodologies, and how any social costs or benefits might be distributed um, across different stakeholder groups. I've mainly been exploring these questions through interviews with various experts by experience in Indonesia and Malaysia. So by that, I mean people who, who either use drones or come into contact with them on a daily basis. Um, in addition, I'm also interested in the potential applications of drone imagery for small scale, high resolution forest inventories. To that end, I've been working alongside a um, reforestation project in the Lower Kinabatangan Wildlife Sanctuary in Sabah, Malaysia. Um, to generate three-dimensional canopy models and above-ground carbon estimates for two reforestation plots um, from, from two-dimensional co colour images that we've gathered using drones. Um, so now, onto the panel. Um, we have four excellent speakers, and I'll, I'll introduce them properly in a second. Uh, they're all going to be giving a five-minute presentation on the different aspects of drones in conservation before we head into a panel discussion and a question and answer. Um, as Naomi said, it's great that we have a really diverse and multidisciplinary group of participants here today with a range of different backgrounds and experience. Now, because of that, some of you may be very familiar with drones, and some of you not. Likewise, I know we have people in the audience who are specialists in, in GIS, in engineering, political ecology, biology, and some for whom they, these may be quite unfamiliar subjects. And so our hope is that this session will act as an introduction to some of the current thinking around drone technologies and the key related debates, uh, getting us all on the same page and really setting the scene for the next two days of the workshop. We will be discussing uh, the current state of drone technologies and their uses in the field, different forms of data collection and data analysis, future integration with other technologies, as well as some of the potential negative impacts that monitoring technologies such as drones can have upon people, communities, and conservation outcomes. And all of these are themes that we're hoping to explore further throughout the rest of the workshop. Um, although drones have been around in, in some form or another for quite a while, arguably since around World War II, 
their use in conservation specifically really only began in earnest in the late 2000s or the early 2010s. Since then, their use has increased massively, as has the diversity of ways that they've been applied to collect and gather data for conservation purposes. Yet despite the growing use of drones in biodiversity conservation, this is still very much an emerging field, uh, which presents an exciting opportunity for all of us with many options still to be explored and many questions still to be asked. And we're hoping to really push that conversation forward um, here, like I said, over the next few days. So in, in a moment, I will uh, introduce our first panelist, but before that, I'll just comment on the, on the format of the session. As I said, each panelist is gonna talk for about five minutes um, and at the end of the presentations, we're going to have a panel discussion and a Q&A. We're hoping to have around 45 minutes for the discussion questions, so there's plenty of time to get stuck in. Um, feel free to write your questions in the chat box as and when they come to you. And I think what we're going to do is, is answer them at the end of all four presentations. Um, Juan is our technical help for this session, so he's going to be collating them. And what we might do is if there are a couple of questions that touch on very similar subjects, we might ask them all together at once. Um, please make sure when you when you type up your question to say who you're directing it at. Um, and I think we'll be able to, depending on the amount of questions we get, um, be able to have your camera and microphone on if you, if you want to sort of have, have a conversation with the panelists. Um, also, as Naomi said at the beginning, please feel free to provide your own answers in the chat for any of the questions that crop up and that you feel well positioned to answer. We'd like this to, to be as, as interactive as possible and to generate some really interesting discussions. Um, and speakers, just to let you know, Naomi has control over the slides, so just let her know when you want to progress to the next one. And I will give you all a, um, a, a message, a private message through Zoom when we get to the one minute mark left for your presentation. Okay, so enough of that. Um, I would now like to introduce our first panellist, um, Serge Vick. Serge is a professor at Liverpool John Moores University. His research focuses on primate behavioural ecology, tropical rainforest ecology, and the conservation of primates and their habitats. He has a keen interest in using technology and particularly drones for academic research and conservation. So, Serge, if you're there, um, over to you. Hello. Uh, thank you for, for, for the introduction and thank you everyone, uh, or the organizers for inviting me and thanks everyone for, for, for being here for this session. Um, so if I could have the first slide, I'll uh, give uh, sort of a an overview of, of, of where drones fit in, in conservation science, because not everybody is a conservation scientist that, that is uh, in, in this uh, conference. So we, in conservation science, we have a couple of, of main questions uh, that relate to monitoring animals, where they are, how many of them there are, their habitats, uh, how that habitat is made up, like what kind of tree species can we find there, and monitoring the, the threats to both the animals and, and their habitats. Uh, threats can be agriculture, poachers, other threats to, to, to wildlife and their habitats. So we've been using an array of, of, of technologies to, to answer those questions. Satellites are, are a very common one. Uh, acoustic recording units, you see a little frog sitting on one on the, on the image, are used for that. We, we camp out in the forest to, to gather data. We fly with, with little planes. We put all kinds of uh, little pieces of technology on animals that give us indications of, of where they are and when they are at certain places. And we, we put out camera traps. And all these technologies have their advantages and, and disadvantages. Satellites come with, with moderate or high resolution, but not nearly as high as we sometimes want them to be. Uh, they, their images can be obscured by clouds. Audio recorders record a lot of data, which is great, but also has the disadvantage that you have to listen to all these data to, to find out what the animals are on these calls. Camping out in a forest is wonderful. I really enjoy it, but it's also very costly and it's slow. You don't cover much ground. Flying with planes is great, but also risky. Uh, it's a very common uh, cause of, of death among wildlife biologists, unfortunately. And um, putting tags on animals is sometimes not possible. There's ethical questions surrounding that. 
And camera traps have, have great opportunities, but they also need uh, new batteries at times. Their SD cards need to be emptied out. They're, they're costly to put out over large areas. So if we can go to the next slide, um, we are also now using drones to, to help us with uh, these questions. You know, the next slide is coming up. I don't see it yet, but maybe. Um, so yeah, thank you, Naomi. Um, so drones come roughly in, in, in three different kinds. On the, um, the left, there's, there's fixed wings, which, are, uh, which look like normal planes. Uh, in the middle, there's multi-rotors, and to the right, there's sort of a mixture of, of both. So a fixed wing has one propeller and, and flies horizontally. It's great to cover large areas, but it also needs a fairly large area to take off and land in. And that's not always available when, when you work in forested areas, for instance. So often people use multi-rotors. So these have propellers on top. You probably, most of you have seen these things either uh, on TV or as a toy somewhere um, in, a, in a park. They can take off vertically and um, they need very little space to take off and land. So there is an advantage, but they fly for less long than fixed wings. So people are trying to mix both into hybrid systems that take off as a multi-rotor. So they take off vertically and then they fly horizontally. So you have in a way best of both worlds, but they also have their disadvantages. They're quite novel, they're quite costly, and they also fly less long than fixed wings, for instance. Now to, to obtain data, um, biologists put a, a mixture of, of cameras under these systems. They put uh, visual spectrum, thermal, and they use those to observe animals directly and indirectly. So you can see orangutan nests here on the image, you see some elephants, and you can see some spider monkeys in the thermal. Now, as with some of these other technologies, drones generate a lot of data. So people are now using machine learning to try to sift through those data to actually get to the detections and classifications of these animals. Um, there's other sensors that we can put on drones, but some of the other speakers will uh, speak about that. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here with this very short overview of technology and, and, and how drones fit into that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serge. Um, great. Okay, the next uh, next speaker up is is Andrew Cunliffe. So, if Naomi, you want to progress it across one. Excellent. Okay, so hello, Andrew. Uh, Andrew Cunliffe is a geographer who makes extensive use of multi rotor and fixed wing drones for observing environmental systems. He has used them to study vegetation structure and function in drylands, coastline geomorphology, tropical rainforests, and beaver reintroductions. He leads a global network of drone operators conducting collaborative experiments. So over to you, Andy. Thanks, Ben. Um, and thanks so much for setting the scene, because it's, it's really important, especially as Naomi emphasised when we're speaking to such a diverse um, audience. So I'd like to, um, could we advance to the next slide? I'd like to turn to some of the common applications that drones are being used for and finish off by posing a question to all of us who use drones to collect observations of our world. And as Serge um, pointed out, cameras are the most common sensor that we're using to collect environmental data from drones. And nearly all the drones that operate today are equipped with cameras that can collect, a, a, enable a huge array of inspection and survey tasks. And for many conservation applications, we can use software to convert these hundreds or even thousands of individual photographs into those continuous mosaics of imagery across the areas that interest us. And these mosaics are really brilliant in enabling us to observe landscapes in ways that we, they may have never been seen before, but putting all of those images together needs computers, software, and often some skill. So for me, the main value of drones as a survey tool comes from their capacity to capture these really fine grain observations, the detailed pictures or, or other data at temporal frequencies that matter to an, permit us to learn something new about those systems that we're studying. 
for example, when we've been working in the Arctic previously, because we could measure um, permafrost shoreline positions every few days, we could see that the shoreline change was highly episodic in response to predicting particular storm events or the conditions of the ocean, rather than just being a slow, steady progression of change over time. So those drone observations enabled us to challenge and start to refine some conceptual, but also numerical representations of those systems, those shoreline dynamics, helping us to understand how they both function now and how they might continue to function in the future if those events that drive rapid change perhaps become more common. So these fine resolution top-down two-dimensional perspectives are really valuable for a whole host of applications. Um, one in the UK, we're using them to map invasive species loaded endrum, which we can then use to form targeted management interventions over areas of tens of hectares or more we can say these are the exact places that you want to on the ground in order to um, take out those invasive species. And the other speaker will continue to showcase many other examples. There's a nice paper out today in Remote Sensitive Ecology and Conservation on using drones to map floral communities, so lots of plants that are growing on vertical cliffs, areas that are virtually inaccessible apart from to um, rock climbers but then you need rock climbers with botanical skills and it's very difficult to get to different areas. So they're really leveraging the capacity of drones to observe those subjects in hard to reach areas. And something I want to touch on that speaks to what's seen displayed in this photograph is that drones are very commonly described as low cost tools. And it's true that the hardware is low cost compared to the cost of a satellite, for example, but by the time we factor in the logistical expense of field work in often extremely remote locations, the hardware cost for processing and the investment of time and skill to obtain the outputs, we often find that there's a significant cost associated. And I think that everybody who's used drones to collect data will have encountered some of these challenges, which can absorb not trivial amounts of time. And I think it's important for us to continue to be aware of this and just remember that drones are not always the right tool for every single application and to continue to try to focus on the areas that they're going to allow us to um, keep use, utilizing their strengths. Could we advance to the next slide? So drone data can also enable us to infer far more than simple two-dimensional top-down perspectives. One example of this is by using some of these photogrammetry techniques where we can take photographs that are collected in a certain way to make a three dimensional reconstruction of a subject. So this animation and I apologize if the, the quality is a little bit degraded. Um, it shows a patch of shrubland in the Chihuahuan Desert in North America that's about 20 meters by 50 meters and while the reconstruction is noisy, it clearly captures a lot of the structure that's inherent in that ecosystem. We can see there's some shrubs, there are patches of grass, and from these models, we can extract information about the size of the plants, the biomass associated carbon storage, fodder, and even the spiky cacti that are usually very difficult to measure by hand can be reconstructed. And this matters because these plants form the foundations of these food webs in most ecosystems and this this one's no exception from that and we can use these observations to understand some of the processes that lead to degradation in these landscapes. Could we move on to the next slide before I make everyone too seasick? Um, so we're increasingly seeing drone data used as part of ecological monitoring programs around the world and there's a lot of efforts ongoing to understand the replicability and reproducibility of those drone observations. And these bits matter because we know that the findings are often sensitive to the ways in which drone data are collected, processed and analysed. So for me, the really critical point that I'd like to pose to a broader community is saying, I think we need to think seriously about community standards for collecting drone data. And what do we need to do to enable multi-site syntheses um, to ensure that our hard-won data can be used to its full potential? So I apologize if I was going a bit too slowly. Thanks, Ben.
Thank you very much, Andy. It's really interesting stuff and remarkably good internet connection for being in a cave. Um, <laughs> the next, and then our next speaker is Margarita Malero Pasmani. And again, I hope I've pronounced that one correctly. Uh, Margarita works as a lecturer in Liverpool John Moores University. She is a conservation biologist investigating new technologies, mainly drones, for ecology research and wildlife management, identifying use cases where the systems can immediately improve conventional methodology by reducing time, costs, and disturbance. Um, she also works on road ecology and tourism effects on wildlife populations. Um, so over to you, Margarita. Hi, thank you, uh, Ben, and thanks uh, to the committee for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, could you please go to the first slide, please? Yeah. Thanks. So here, um, I would like to provide a very brief general overview on current drone applications for biodiversity studies. And then I would like to focus on what I believe that may constitute new opportunities for the future of, of this technology in wildlife conservation and, and research. Uh, most of the current applications of drones in, in biodiversity studies are based on gathering aerial images. I think this is an intuitive approach and it presents some obvious advantages over other alternatives as a search uh, which mentioned before. The drones provide an aerial perspective that increases detectability of uh, vegetation and animal species. And if we use uh, other sensors different from the RGB ones, such as thermal sensor, multispectral cameras, this increase even more our detectability of, of wildlife and of uh, animals and vegetation. So the main advantages are that drones provide <coughs> a high spatial resolution info because we can fly really low and also a high temporal resolution because this technology is very fast to deploy. And um, because we have the tracks of the drones, we can repeat the flights and get uh, repeatability, which is needed for many ecological studies. And uh, well, they, as somebody mentioned before, they are supposed to be low cost and this can be arguable, but uh, the basics are affordable in general. So the most abundant applications are related to monitoring the vegetation and the animals for censusing, or basically medium or large, large size uh, species such as birds or mammals, and also to monitor the infrastructures that they create, for example, barrows for marmots. And they can also help us to study how human infrastructures affect uh, the natural environment. I'm talking about power lines or roads or buildings or the human activities that take place in, in different areas. Because drones provide a new and mainly low invasive uh, perspective, they help us to look at wildlife from another point of view and to investigate topics related to animal behavior, ecology, to study the, the relationship between uh, different species or the individuals of the same species and also to conduct some management regarding the detection, for example, of illegal activities. Could we please pass to the next slide? <coughs> and I'm sorry, I'm... I'm Thank you. So what I wanted to, um, to highlight here is that drones may be more than flying cameras. Drones have, drones are robots them, themselves, so they have robotic capabilities that may be exploited for promising uh, research avenues. For example, if we attach simple devices, we can use them for sampling in the atmosphere. The atmosphere for us, because we are terrestrial creatures, may look uh, very often kind of empty, so it's just the air above us somehow, but there are lots of things living up there. So uh, insects, pollen, and bacteria, for example, can be captured and studied. And this may provide new insights on biodiversity composition. I, I would also like to remind or to highlight that we are currently experiencing this insects Armageddon as uh, called by the media. So I believe that drones can uh, help us uh, better understanding the composition of the species, their distribution, their movement patterns in the atmosphere. 
Drones can also be used for water sampling, uh, and this may save lots of effort because the alternative are getting into the water. And again, we are terrestrial creatures, and that is uh, not a very uh, comfortable media for us. So um, uh, the drones can be equipped with, uh, with sampling tools for the water or even with sensors that may allow to gather uh, interest and information uh, just by putting the sensors into the water from the drone. They can also be used as communication stations, mobile stations that may allow downloading data from target animals. Then this uh, would work at local scale uh, to gather info from animals that are close enough from the drone to, to get their data uh, transfer. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, I believe that studying the atmosphere is an exciting opportunity. And I think that we are uh, currently using drones uh, as if we were using a boat to look at the land while the water may be more interesting. Okay, so I believe that using a drone that is a, a flying object to study the atmosphere may open a very uh, interesting path. We don't know how the distribution of bats, insects, birds work and what are the ecological process or the trophic processes among the different aerial creatures. So I think that drones may help in that regard. And finally, uh, in an increasingly connected world, I believe that drones are not uh, so interesting working by themselves, although they are definitely useful, but they can also be added as another tool that can complement and be integrated into, sen into sensor networks. So uh, we, can, we can do that independently. So just the sum of different sensors working together or if drones are integrated uh, into Internet of Things, which is a, basically a network of connected objects, they can work without human intervention. And that may be very useful to monitor ecological interesting processes. For example, water pollution or other things that may happen out in the field where having fixed sensors, drones, terrestrial vehicles may help to, to get a better idea on, on what's going on in the field. I, I hope that these avenues are further explored and uh, I hope that you may find this useful somehow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita. Um, I think that's a really interesting point actually pointing out that, that drones are more of a platform. We just happen to stick cameras on them more often than not, but there's a, there's a lot of other things that we can do by having this access to the, the space above us. Um, Right, so we, we've heard now about kind of what drones can do and some of their applications in, uh, uh, in conservation. We're now gonna move on to some of the risks that might be attached to such monitoring technologies. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Sandbrook. He's a conservation social scientist with diverse research interests around a central theme of biodiversity conservation and its relationship with society. His current research investigates the social and political implications of new technologies for conservation the relationship between conservation and development at the landscape scale in developing countries, and the role of values and evidence in shaping the decisions of conservationists in their organizations. So um, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be part of this panel. It's really great to be here at this event. Um, so the, the previous speakers have outlined very well the amazing capacities of drones to collect new data and provide new insights for conservation and ecology. Um, and I just want to use my few minutes here to broaden the perspective slightly by situating drones as social and political actors rather than as uh, merely technical instruments. And then um, could I have the next slide, please, Naomi? So this photograph, which was taken by Bhaskar Sati during uh, Trishant Simlai's fieldwork for his PhD in India, shows a group of local residents uh, running away from a drone uh, which is being launched by forest department staff in a village close to a national park. And for me, this is a really great image to help us to think about some of the social and political effects that drones might have. So firstly, and most obviously, it shows that they, they do have social effects. In this case, the launching of the drone has triggered a response in the crowd watching on. Many of them have, have chosen to run away. And I think this helps to remind us that technologies are never socially neutral. Their use always triggers some kind of, of effects uh, for people. Secondly, the image shows us that the effects of drones are varied. Some people in this crowd, I think, look a bit worried and concerned. Um, maybe they're a bit afraid of what's happening. 
many others look quite happy and excited. There's laughter in their faces, they're enjoying themselves, um, you know, maybe amazed by this flying gadget that they've never seen before. And I think this reflects what we see with drones more widely. Sometimes they are welcomed and they can have positive effects for, for local resident people. And in other cases, they can cause problems. They can cause fear, um, they can be used to invade privacy, and they can have effects on things like employment opportunities. Um, and in the worst cases, they can be associated with risks of exploitation or abuse by those um, who are using drones. And the third thing I think this image shows is that drones can have different effects on different people. So in this particular image, the people who are running away um, are mostly women and children, uh, whereas the, the man you can see on the right hand side of the image, uh, who's slightly blurred, seems to be walking towards uh, the drone. And I, I wasn't present when this picture was taken, so I don't want to overanalyze what, what's going on here, but I think it nonetheless serves to um, illustrate the point that different people in this picture are, are being affected by the use of drones in different ways. And actually, we, we do find this when we look at uh, the effects of drones, they can vary by things like gender, um, class or, or ethnic group. And uh, Trishant Simlai will tell you more about this when he speaks about his PhD research uh, during which this image was taken in the, in the first session tomorrow. Next slide, please. So if conservation drones um, have this social and political dimension to them, how can we make sense of it? How can we understand um, what's going on socially and politically and perhaps what we should do about it? And of course, drones, as we've just been hearing, are a very new technology and certainly new as applied to conservation. But the way in which they can bring about social effects um, is actually something which we can, we can see as a, a continuation of uh, decades, and if not centuries, of thinking about surveillance and its effects on people. So there's already a lot that we know uh, about um, surveillance, and I think we should try and uh, make use of that for our thinking about drones. And just to give one famous example of this uh, is the idea of the, the panopticon prison, first conceived by Jeremy Bentham, the English philosopher in the 18th century. And in this image, you can see a, an example that was built in, in Illinois in the USA. Um, the panopticon was designed so that a single guard located in the central tower would be able to see into all of the cells of the prisoners located around the outside of this enormous circular structure. So each individual prisoner could be watched at any time, but they actually would have no way of knowing if they were being watched at any particular moment, because of course the guard couldn't look everywhere at once. But because there was a risk that they were being watched, the effect on the prisoners was to behave as if they were being watched constantly. And as a result, they would learn to regulate their own behavior uh, to avoid the risk of detection by the guard and, and become more compliant with the rules of the prison. And this idea was further developed uh, in the 20th century by French philosopher and sociologist Michel Foucault. And he described the effect of constant surveillance on citizens as a form of disciplinary governmentality. And what he meant by that was a tool of government used to encourage the self-regulation of behavior to achieve societal goals at relatively minimal cost in terms of policing and enforcement. You can get people to regulate their own behavior. You don't have to worry about doing it through enforcement. And I think we can see drones and other conservation surveillance technologies like camera traps um, as examples of this in practice. People who know that there are drones around may feel that they are under constant surveillance and change their behavior accordingly, even if in fact the drones are, are not intended to watch people at all. Um, many of the uh, applications we've just heard about are, are purely the kind of ecological and research perspectives uh, or um, applications and are not deliberately intending to collect data from people at all. And the way in which people might self-regulate their behavior in this context could be seen as a good thing. It could be seen as simply um, uh, helping to deter people from carrying out crimes and illegal activities, or it could be seen as a bad thing, um, where people are subjected to an unnecessary and intrusive invasion of privacy. Uh, we could think of it as a human rights abuse, and indeed it would be understood as such under the UN Charter of Human Rights. And how we interpret this will depend on various factors. You know, who is using the technology? For what purpose is the technology being used? Who are the people who are being affected by it? And so on. But I think regardless, what is undeniable is that there are social effects of drones, whether intended or otherwise, and that these need to be taken seriously. They can be positive or negative um, for people, and indeed they can then go on to have positive or negative implications for conservation itself, because 
uh, conservation success in the long term depends so heavily on relations with um, human stakeholders. So I've been working on these issues for a few years now. And in that time, I think I've, I've been somewhat alarmed by seeing the uh, effects, often negative effects, which drones can have in the field for resident people. But I've also been really heartened by the high level of awareness and concern for these issues among the drone user community um, whom, whom I've encountered. And I think at this time, at this time, it's now the stage where we should be moving on from awareness to action and actually developing and applying um, sensible guidelines to help ensure that the use of these technologies is socially responsible. And I hope everyone will have the chance to join later today when we have a, a workshop session that particularly focuses on that on that issue. But for now, I'd, I'd like to wrap up there and just encourage everyone to consider the social and political as well as the technical dimensions of drones in the way that we use them. And I, I'm looking forward to discussing these issues now and in the rest of the, the event. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Chris. And thank you very much to uh, the four of you. They're great presentations. And I apologize for having to sort of restrict you down to just five minutes. Um, Naomi has now stopped screen sharing. So if I could ask the four of you to, to pop your screens on. Um, we're, I, I've got a few questions here, which I'll, I'll lead in with. But I, again, I'd like to encourage everyone watching to, um, to, to get their questions in in the chat, and then we, we can get to them in good time. Um, likewise, if any of the if, um, speakers make any points that you'd like to comment on, stick that in there. We just, we just want to get as, as good of dialogue going as possible. Um, so first, actually, this question, I guess, is directed more towards you, Chris, but then also, Serge, you, you touched on it in your presentation, actually, um, about the impact that, that drones might have upon conservation labour. Um, so conducting a population density survey um, with a drone might be much quicker than by doing it on foot and take fewer people, require fewer resources. Do you think there is a risk um, of drones eliminating employment opportunities within the conservation sector? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, I think there is certainly a risk of that, or, or, or at least we can say more confidently of, of having some kind of effect and changing the way in which conservation labour operates. So it may be that some um, jobs that have existed in the past that were boots on the ground roles um, go, and perhaps, but perhaps they're replaced by you know, some sort of technical role being a drone operative or, or somebody who's involved in data analysis uh, and processing. Um, so I think we... That's not to say that that's necessarily a terrible thing, but we need to just think about what the effects of that might be. And uh, one example I'd say is, um, I think sometimes people who go and do boots on the ground patrols are actually very important in terms of things like relationships with local residents in local villages or, or in the community, because they, they, they just have that opportunity to interact with people on a daily basis. Perhaps they come from those communities themselves. And if those are, are lost and replaced by, by drones, then you might gain something in terms of data collection and efficiency, but lose something on that on that kind of community side. And that's something I think um, to just you know, be, be careful about and think through. And then maybe a, a sort of slightly broader, more philosophical point is, um, I think we, we could start to see something that almost looks like the death of field work as um, more and more data is co collected um, remotely with, with technologies, be it drones or, or others, and are then fed through to centers of calculation in you know, universities elsewhere in the world. I think we might start to find that you know, professional conservationists and ecologists just have spent much less time in the field than used to be the case in the past. And that, that might have knock-on consequences for how we understand conservation issues. Yeah, no, no, those, are, they're all, those are all great points. I, 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 so far in my own work, I haven't seen any sort of job losses related to, to drones. I have seen that um, maybe upscaling is not the right word, but that, that, that field workers spend more time on, on using drones and, and using uh, the data analytics behind that. I, I think that in some cases that, that is a benefit for the individual people because it allows them to potentially have transferable skills uh, that gives them more opportunities in their career than, than merely collecting data with pen and paper. I, I totally agree with Chris that those personal contacts during patrols and during field work with local communities are totally essential for, for the conservation projects. And we should be very careful with um, not replacing those with technology. Um, in terms of the, 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 the last remark, Chris, I, 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 I'm, as a curious biologist, I think there's always more we want to know. And I think drones allow us 
in a way to spend time on collecting data in a certain way and spend more time, for instance, in taking soil samples or other things that otherwise we couldn't do because we have to do these surveys for other things. So I think it's, it's, it will be very interesting to see how technology drives potential changes uh, in, in data collection and, and whether that actually means it will allow us to spend more time on identifying plants actually in the forest and collecting insects and other things that now we often don't have time for. Uh, that remains to be seen, but it, it, there will certainly be shifts in, in, in how this will work. And we have to, to be very mindful of potential negative consequences of that. Certainly, yeah, for sure. But actually, um, uh, building up off of that then, I, I think maybe it's fair to say that there, there's definitely a shift in how data collection maybe takes place and the skills that are required to, to take part in, if you like, modern data collection. Um, and I, I know that, for instance, using drones successfully um, requires sometimes like a fairly high level of, of expert knowledge, especially around things like uh, GIS or, or data processing. Um, and so I guess I'm interested in how reliant these sort of initiatives that might choose to employ drones become on um, outside knowledge. You know, is it, is it possible for them to become self-sustainable self or is there always a requirement on outsourcing some of that expertise, some of that sort of techno-scientific expertise? I think uh, uh, maybe I could turn it back to Chris or, or Margarita or, or, or Andy, feel free to chip in. <laughs> Well, I I guess it depends on the um, on the aim of uh, why or the reason why you're using drones and what is the product you expect to get. I think that if you simply want to get aerial views of uh, vegetation and you are happy with uh, let's say five meter resolution mosaic, you can do that with uh, open source software and without very modern uh, technology. If you want to do complex 3D modeling with high resolution, or if you want to work with multispectral sensors, all that stuff, you definitely need more uh, specialized tools. So you, you may end up working with a software that requires a license, or you require a computer that, that has uh, better specifications to work faster and, and better. So I guess it, it, it's dependent on the aim. Same for the cost. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have already mentioned that. I think low cost platforms are okay to get a video, to get a, a fast image, something like that. If you wanna go into, into something more complicated, then you would definitely leave uh, some people out of the, of the picture. Yeah, the ones that do not have resources. So. I, I might just add to that very quickly that I think, um, when we think about the potential of drones to be used as a tool for things like community empowerment, and um, you know, Naomi gave a really nice example in her introductory talk about people using, using drones to collect data that they were able to use to, to challenge an established narrative about their own role in, in managing habitats. Yeah, that, that's fantastic and it shows that it can work, but you know, what, what Margarita is saying about the complexities and the cost involved can perhaps just limit that to, to certain particular applications. And, um, yeah, but may, you know, maybe if uh, people can get support with that and get training with, with, with using these tools, then they can have that opportunity to be, to be more empowering. I, I would like to add that um, because in the last years, drone use has uh, increased so much and they, also the profile of the users is more and more diverse. So I think that many of us here are aiming at publishing papers. Yeah, it, the ones working in academia are working into sophisticated methodologies, and and we try to push that to to the as much as we can. So in that regard, that that is also, I mean, that's important. And and for that, as said, we require uh, large investments and sophisticated tools. If the idea is to get aerial videos just to prove that I don't know, there is going to there is illegal logging in your area uh, across six months, you don't need to work on 3D models with that, those levels of, uh, you know, sophistication. So I guess that it also depends on the type of drone users, yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, okay, then I, I have an, another question actually. So talking about sophistication, it's all linking together rather well. Um, alongside drone technologies, um, satellite remote sensing technologies are also kind of increasing and, and getting more advanced um, in terms of both spatial and temporal resolution. A good example that people might be familiar with is NASA's uh, JEDI mission, uh, which looks to sort of use LIDAR to create a global data set of forest structure. Do you think that in the next decade or so, we will see drones being replaced or being phased out in favor of higher resolution satellite products? You know, are drones just a kind of temporary blip in remote sensing, or do you think they'll always have a place um, in, in conservation monitoring and surveillance, if you like? Um, Andy? Um, so it's a good question. Thanks, Ben. And I think from my perspective, I think we'll see a continued move towards drones being used for particular applications where their capabilities outperform all the other options. So in some areas, I think we're still in kind of a phase of explosion and exploration in terms of drones being tried out and tested as tools for many different applications. And I think as time goes on, we're going to see more and more of those applications as being seen as actually, if you want to answer these questions, you're better off using these different sorts of data. Um, personally, I think that crop monitoring for the most part is going to move towards a satellite data domain rather than drone domain. And I know that's a controversial view, um, but there are many things that satellite data can't do and drones are going to carry on to be the, the, the tool of choice for those applications. And I think in, in terms of JEDI specifically, I think there's such a diff such a gap in the scales between the global scale data collection with that LIDAR instrument that shoots laser pulses off the International Space Station and measures what's there in terms of structure of the vegetation or the landscape but it integrates everything over kind of a footprint of 30 odd square meters. It's quite a big area and very different to the kind of degree of detail that we get from most drone data sets. And I think that global coverage of the big footprints, just sampling at individual spot locations and leaving big gaps between them that you try and make up or interpolate what's between them is just very, very different to the drone data. And I think they're two such different things. I don't think there'll be a direct conflict between those for qu quite a few years to come, but that, that's just my perspective. I'd be interested in hearing others. I, I, I mean, I, I agree to a large extent with, with Andy, and I think one, one of the, the issues with, with satellite data is, particularly for us working in the, in the tropics, is persistent cloud cover. Uh, in, in certain areas, which is, makes it really difficult sometimes to get the time series you require. Also for, for um, aspects of, of habitats where, where we need very short intervals uh, in time, it will probably take a while before satellites can, can do that. I mean, I think it's gonna be unlikely for the very near future that uh, that will have thermal satellite data at, at four centimeters resolution. Um, that's just, I mean, that would require quite some technological hoops to, to, to achieve that. And so I think there's, there's indeed a, a space for, for, for satellites and, and drones and it's figuring out what works best when and helping people with those questions. I mean, I think all of us often get questions about drones and people very enthusiastic to, to use them. Whereas sometimes you're like, mm, yeah, but maybe satellites are be really the better option for you here. And, and, and maybe there's no need to jump on the drone bandwagon if you like to, to, to start using them because there's this other technology that might give you that, that answer that you need um, in, in a more affordable uh, a way than, than, than drones will. So I think it, it's really thinking those things through very carefully. Where do we need what technology? Can I just add to that very quickly, Ben, that I think um, as satellite sensing gets more and more high resolution spatially and temporally, some of the, the ethical issues that that begins to raise are, are really profound. You know, we're, we're, it's one thing to think about a, a, a noisy drone hovering overhead that you kind of know is there and you can you sort of 
are aware that something's going on. It's quite another to have satellites in space that you could never be aware of from the ground, you know, constantly collecting very high resolution data that could be used to identify people and, and what they're doing. Um, you know, who gets to use that data and to what ends, um, I think is really important. Although that, you know, they are, it's very exciting what we could do with the technology, but it could also be used for, for ill in various ways. Yeah, can I, can I quickly link into that? I, I think Chris making an excellent point about that, that we really need to think about these social aspects for all the different technologies we're, we're using. Drones, I think, have, have, have really triggered that discussion uh, to, to much more intensely than it was before. But I think a lot of the same issues are there with camera traps, people taking pictures of, of people in, in the forest with acoustic sensors. So we, we really need to, to be very well aware of, of these potential impacts of all these different technologies and work through them with local communities about how, how we deploy those things and, and not things of, think of drones in isolation with that because then I think we might make a mistake because some of these same issues are there for some of the other technologies. They're, they're just less obvious. Uh, sometimes, but we do need to consider them as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we're now in the interest of time, I think we're going to turn towards some of the audience questions. We've had quite a few come through. Um, so I'm just reading them off the screen here. Um, the first one is from uh, George Cusworth. Uh, he's asking, when are drones weak? Are there instances where drones or the data collected by drones make simplifications and assumptions that lead to erroneous calculations about the, being, the things being surveyed. So he's put here as an example, mistake, mistaking one type of tree for a different one or a river for a road. And how might these mistakes scale? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure who wants to come in on that one. I'm happy, okay. You go. <laughs> Marguerite, we haven't heard from you in a while. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, um, I, I agree that with this and where it's written. Uh, I definitely, I, I agree that the, there are instances when the data collected is wrong or the, or the inference that we make of the data is wrong. And that's why um, this goes in line with what Chris mentioned before. I believe that human presence in the field is still important. You need to have a ground truth, yeah? It's very important to, to make sure that you go to the field and that you, uh, I think a drone image cannot be the only thing you have to, to, to approach uh, the study of an area. It's super important to go to the area, to gather the information from the ground, and then make sure that, that, you, enter, that you interpret the, um, the images in the right way. And well, from a more general perspective, uh, experimental design is important no matter what technology or what methodology you're using. So I mean, from a wider uh, perspective, I think that the design should be carefully reviewed before reaching any conclusions, but that applies to all, any scientific experiments, not just for drones. So did you want to comment on that or? Well, actually, before you do, that we, there's a related question to that one. Um, uh, where the current, uh, where do the current tech, where does the current tech present a specific limitation? Can I follow up on? The... Oh, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll just keep going, Andy, because I think that you cut out there. But um, uh, Seth's interested in figuring out where to push the technologists to give more useful outcomes. I guess. Uh, when pursuing a data collection mission. So it's sort of related in, in asking where are the sort of limitations to drones? And I guess, you know, wh where do we need to improve um, in terms of their capabilities? And, and Andy, I don't know if you've caught up with us now and you could speak now or Serge, if you're ready. Yes, I think so. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I think I'm really interested in how different teams around the world have come up with different workflows, different ways of collecting drugs, ultimately often is incompatible and how that's really holding back progress and efforts to do data syntheses and put together. What can we learn from what 
one set of users in one country or even one lab and the lab group next door if they're doing things in different ways and often in science it's a really good thing to be doing things in different ways in order to test well how confident should we be in in the conclusions that we get but i kind of think as a community we need to start putting together our, our insights into these technical aspects to say actually these are the bits that really matter and if you're just interested in collecting data that's useful to you now and others in the future maybe here are some some simple guidelines that we can work towards for these applications and one area where drones really let us down at the moment i think is an awful lot of people use dji drones which are wonderful because we can take them off the shelf and pop them up in the air very quickly and easily and there's very little training required because of the, the interfaces are relatively straightforward but most of those drones apply pre-processing to the images they capture so what gets saved on the sd card is already a distorted perception of reality and it's very difficult to move back through that and undo that so there's a challenge for the drone manufacturer especially as a, a global community we're increasingly reliant on that the products from that single manufacturer and there are issues with some of the the assumptions that they decide to roll out to the world fantastic thank you um we've got another set of two questions from ural who i think um they go together quite nicely um and uh, they are how do we go about processing the sheer amount of data that drones can collect? And what are the risks of creating systems that become autonomous and do not have a human input? Now, Chris, I know you've worked with Bill Adams and he's, he's written a lot on this, so maybe you wanna um, step in. Uh, okay, sure, uh, just on that second part then. Um, yeah, Bill Adams wrote a paper a couple of years ago called Conservation by Algorithm, where he you know, explored some of the possible implications of this sort of automated responses um, and technology, part of which was about employment and labor, which we already discussed a few minutes ago. Um, but yeah, I suppose also thinking about the complexity of the issues that are involved in on the ground decision-making in, in conservation in particular, and, and how if we turn over some of that decision-making to more automated processes, then as as in any other walk of life, you, know, you always run the risk of, of sometimes making mistakes and getting things wrong and perhaps um, oversimplifying um, what, what's actually happening out there. I think that yeah, that's something that I, I know all users of these technologies are well aware of, and it's just the, the trade-off which has to be negotiated between you know, the benefits of doing that in terms of maybe cost saving, maybe the ability to, to, to look at very large areas simultaneously you know, through a computer rather than a human user, but on the other hand, what, what could go wrong um, in doing so, and then making sure perhaps that there are kind of checks and balances in place to, you know, check decisions before they're implemented on the ground, you know, make sure that what the computer is coming up with actually makes, makes good sense. And I think Thanks, Naomi for sharing the paper. <laughs> yeah, oh yes, and if anyone interested, Naomi has just put the, the Bill Adams paper in the chat. Um, I think it also relates back to what you, you touched on before, Chris, around um, this, 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 there being a lack of people sort of on the ground, if you like, boots on the ground and decisions being made further and further away from, from where they're actually being implemented. Um, with, with a lot of, you know, and creating very automatic pipelines for image recognition and, and decisions and stuff like that. Um, I, I know, Serge, we've spoken before, you're, you're certainly looking into um, machine learning for identifying um, things within these images, I know. Um, I wonder if you wanna speak a bit towards that. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I think that uh, trying to automate uh, image processing for, for detection of animals or, or their signs is, is, is very relevant uh, because of the sheer data volumes that, that drones generate. Uh, but that's always done in, in close collaboration with groups working on, 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 on the ground. Um, so it, 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 um, it, it, in a way, it, it replaces a person looking at images for, for, for weeks or months into a pipeline that does that more automatically and frees up that person's time to, to do other things. Um, and so it, it, the decision making is, 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 is still with, with the organizations that provide the, the, the images. 
and and there's a lot of discussion always involved in, in what kind of images um, should be processed, what kind of information about those images should be provided or or potentially shared in terms of location um, and and particular species on on those images. But but it is certainly a, a, a point that that will continue to be discussed because there will be more automated pipelines. There's websites where you can now share your images for uh, preparing of or for mosaics and, and so that we all can see or for mosaics and images that have been taken by drones in, in, in other parts of the world, which is a great resource. But it, but it also means that the data are, 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 are shared and, and available in high resolution of certain areas with certain landowners or certain communities living there, et cetera, which, which might have, have not been communicated totally with the people that, that are working in, in those lands and maybe their house is on it or a field that they're, that they're growing corn in uh, or, or something else. And that, that all needs careful thinking, I, I think, before we do that. I mean, I'm, I'm a great proponent of sharing data and, and making data publicly available. But at the same time, we have to be very, very aware, well aware of, of these issues uh, with, with, with drone data. Oh, oh, I am unmuted. Um, well, there's a, another question come in again from Mural, and I apologize if that's your first name or last name, I'm not sure, we've just got Mural, but um, they ask, are the intentions and applications of drones often, mis often misunderstood and seen as intended for more intrusive purposes? So I guess this is also getting at more, what have the reactions of, of, of people on the ground been when, when you've been using drones within these communities? Um, uh, I, I don't know if, if he wants to come in first, but if you could speak towards your kind of like you know, your, your lived experiences of conducting some of these um, these missions, if you like. I mean, I'm happy to quickly say something. I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to generalize. I think things like privacy are, 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 are mean different things for people in different parts of, of, of the world. and. We, even within those communities mean different things to different people. So it, it, it very much depends on, on local context, I think. And, and at least that's what I've noticed in my own field work, that, in, that it, it really it depends on, on, on the, the communities. Um, just, just to pop in there, Mural, I've been informed, is in fact the the collaborative note-taking app that everyone's using. So apparently there's lots of questions coming in there. We don't just have one very excited person called Mural. Um, so yeah, please do, do make sure to put your questions there. I'm now on board with what's going on, but also put them in the chat if, if you want to. Um, Andy or Margarita, uh, what have your experiences been when, when using drones, you know, in areas that, you know, are social, do have people, you know, living in, in, in them? Should I go? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I normally do not intend to get people either in camera traps or with drones. My studies are focused on, on wildlife and that's, that's my target. But yeah, the, these uh, areas are also sometimes used by, by people. So with one exception, that was anti-poaching work that I may mention after, in general, I, I didn't intend to collect people data, or if I did, I was not interested on the actual person, you know, the identity of the person. I may be interested on how uh, human infrastructures are being used by wildlife. And yeah, of course I can see the cars passing or eventually somebody walking by and that picture is gathered and it's there. I don't share those images and I simply collect the, the metadata, like, okay, this is a human being passing at this time at this place. Mm, I have mainly worked in protected areas. And uh, so I believe that most of the researchers are aware that they can be seen from uh, an airplane or from a camera trap or something like that. There is a small but unlikely uncomfortable side of it because, yeah, camera trap can get you while you're 
going to the toilet, you know, something like that. So the, there is this privacy issue, but most of the people there are aware and are, uh, I would say, used to being observed somehow. Mm, in the antipotent work, uh, that was intentional, but we aimed at, at uh, false targets. Yeah, we have people faking that they were poachers, so they were happy to be uh, detected because that was the purpose of the <laughs> of the study. Mm, I'm not sure on how to work with others that are not intended to be captured. Yeah, by the cameras. That's. Uh, I would say, yeah, regarding data sharing uh, is tricky because, uh, but so far when I have uh, submitted um, uh, info for manuscripts or, you know, to be published, I never included the photos themselves. I may include the database, the data frame where you can see there are records of human beings passing over there, but never their identity or their faces. I'll come in there maybe and say something. <laughs> That's a really interesting overview of a, a breath. Oh, okay. Let, let's have Chris, you go, and then Andy, hold that thought. You can come in afterwards. Great. So I think Andy's got a bit of a delay, which is just making it a bit tricky. Yeah. So what? What? Um, in in the work that, that I've been involved in, in with um with these issues, we we've, we've described what Margarita was just, was talking about there as as human bycatch. This is the kind of by analogy with um fisheries bycatch, where you're trying to catch one species of fish, but you accidentally catch a load of others in your net at the same time. We see very often that drones and other technologies are being used with the intention of getting information about a non-human non species, but then people accidentally kind of show up in the data anyway. And the question then is, is, is what, what happens? And from what Margarita's describing, you know, nothing you know, gets deleted or just described in terms of metadata. But we've actually found with camera traps that very often those data are used then for some kind of management um, uh, it, um, application, which can include things which are which are uh, you know, negative for the people involved, like being reported to, to to the authorities, even though that wasn't the intention initially of, of the way the data were collected. So, yeah, partly what what we've been been sort of calling for is some some protocols to be in place to make sure that that's all thought through in advance. You know, what would we do if we got a picture of somebody doing something and make sure that if there's any need for a consent process or kind of pub, you know, public announcement of, of what might happen, that that's done in advance. And actually this can be an area where automated image processing can really come in handy because if it's possible to um, identify and delete human images before you ever have to look at them, then you kind of save yourself the problem of um, making a difficult ethical choice at a later stage because you, you never even see the data that the, you know, the algorithm takes care of that for you, which um, some some drone users have had some real success, I think, with that with that approach. I would like to to ask to for the debate. I mean, when you're working in a protected area, for example, you know that you are also exposed to the rangers. Uh, view yeah i mean they, you can be detected and you can be detected doing whatever and uh, i'm not sure there is i mean chris as, as an expert on privacy issues why is it so so different i mean why is it so different if you are caught uh, poaching with one of my camera traps in the field or if you are caught by a by a ranger passing by or an ornithologist who is inspecting a nest using their binoculars. Is it so different? I mean, if I catch a poacher with one of my camera traps, which is not likely, but may happen, mm. or somebody doing something illegal, I would probably notify the park authorities to say, you know, I got this. In the same way that I notify, you know, there is a dog, a domestic dog in the area that shouldn't be there. So I would notify it. And, and then I guess I would simply uh, contact the, maybe the, the police, the authorities, to say, you know, this was recorded here, that was trapped, and they may request that I provide the images. And if so, I would, I tend to do what the police requires me to do, and, and that's it. So how is it so different? Yeah, that's a very fair question. I mean, I, I, I suppose it's not necessarily so different. Um, a lot depends on the particular you know, legal framework of the country that you're in, uh, where you're working, the particular tenure arrangements in the protected area, you know, whether it really is a place that nobody is allowed under any circumstances and so on. And clearly there are cases where drones and other devices are being used explicitly for anti-poaching and you know, to catch people who are carrying out illegal activities. 
my view in those cases is that it's still a good idea to make it known you know more widely and in advance you know, there are cameras in operation in this area there are drones in operation in this area this is what would happen if your images are, are, are taken because that partly would help work as a deterrent but also would make it clear to everybody what was going on in advance in the uk for example um if camera traps are, as i understand it if camera traps are put out to to get um ecological data and they then get images of for example somebody who's carrying a, a dead hen harrier over their shoulder who's obviously been out poaching that can't be used in evidence against that person if, if the image was taken in a covert way without having gone through some kind of prior process of approval with, with the police or whatever the relevant authority is. So I think it's, I, you know, I'm a conservationist at heart. So I, don't, I don't think we should be seeing these things as, as a kind of blanket ban on their use. I just think that there's a need to have thought through in advance how that might work, what might be the implications. You know, perhaps it might even be a case where the, you know, somebody being apprehended and arrested as an individual might trigger some wider you know, conflict with, with resident communities, which could actually backfire from a conservation point of view. So it's just a question of, kind of having thought this through uh, and making sure that there's, a, there's a, a, a sensible protocol in place. That's, that's what I would like to see happening. Andy, would you like to, to come in with your, with your comment or should we move on to another question? Um, I guess it's just a quick comment about it's interesting because most of my experience has also been working in protected areas where there's very little interaction with members of the public and, and others in, in local communities. But I wonder if as we move forwards, we start to develop a blind spot in where these drone observations are being collected that excludes those really more heavily human impacted landscapes around the edge or outside of protected areas, which often are those places that we're looking to make a lot of difference in conservation activities in terms of influencing people's behavior. So it's just that awareness that it's, it's still an issue we need to grapple with and, and solve um, even in protected areas. Um, maybe just to, um, Francis has just made a good comment in the chat as well about how even when drones are being used primarily within protected areas there you know, they can they can overfly areas outside protected areas on the way in and the way out and they, they often do end up being used um, outside those areas as well which is obviously particularly true when you're you're up in the air and moving whereas a camera trap is a fixed point in space that, that you know will only get what's in front of it. Okay, so we're we're coming up to the uh, we're coming up to the end of sort of our allotted time. I've got there's loads of questions coming in the chat, and I'd encourage all of you to uh, please respond to them if you can, um, and if you're happy making your responses to everybody rather than private, so we can also be a part of what's going on. But I'm going to read out um, I'm going to read out four more questions, I believe, and then I'm going to give each of you a chance to quickly respond to, to ones which stand out to you, and then then we'll have to bring this to a close. Um, so if you can hold all of these in your head, I've got four to come for you. Um, Monica is asking our human modern Western science relationship with nature has been based on observation and a great eye that looks from above physically and semiotically in terms of Donna Haraway. How could drones generate relationships with non-humans that are more symmetrical? That's question one. Um, Tintin Willie is asking uh, specifically for Margarita, I wonder if you could uh, elaborate a bit more about the application of Internet of Things technologies with drones in conservation. Is there a specific project you're currently working on as an example? Um, Trishant Simlai is asking um, what happens when drone data or any other tech data needs to be given to the state government? Um, will research as have any control on how the state uses drone or tech data, specifically when marginalized and vulnerable people are involved? And finally, if I can just bring it up, um, Jaime's asking, um, have you observed any a change in poachers' behavior in areas where conservation drones are deployed frequently? Now, I appreciate that's a lot to take in, but if, if any of you would like to comment on any of those specifically, um, and again, we'll have a conversation in the chat afterwards. Uh, perhaps Margarita, would you be able to share um, a, a, some more examples of your Internet of Things um, work? 
Yeah, so the, um, well, the specific project that addressed that uh, was called Planet Project. It was a project from the Seven Framework Program on the, the European Commission. And uh, this comes from an approach of uh, conservation. I mean, I know this, this Congress that we are having here is focused on drones, but I, I believe that uh, most of us, we work in ecology or conservation or something more general. Uh, and so drones are just one tool on the box. So the, um, the idea here was to, or the objective of Planet Project was how to monitor large areas or how to benefit from Internet of Things to improve uh, the, the effectiveness of, of monitoring large areas, particularly to detect and uh, non-predictable phenomena such as pollution. So when you are dealing with large protected areas, it's impossible to, to control all of it, you know? And so we use them a mixture of fixed and mobile sensors to try to, to better uh, get information of the area. Basically uh, some fixed stations. And when, when I talk about fixed station, uh, stations, I'm talking about uh, water sensors, um, so chemical sensors, light detectors, all of these fed by a battery uh, with a generator with a solar um, power. And these are dispersed in the, in the protected area. When one of these fixed stations sends an alarm because it has detected one value that is out of the pre-programmed range. So for example, something that may suggest there is a pollution event let's say water pollution, then that alarm triggers the deployment of either drones, so aerial unmanned systems or terrestrial uh, systems such as uh, UGVs, yeah, unmanned ground vehicles. So this would uh, um, go to the area where something has been detected in order to either drop more sensors or gather pictures or get more information on that particular spot. So the idea is that it's impossible to have drones, impossible, probably not, not very respectful uh, and, and, and not very effective in economical terms to have drones flying all over the place. It's impossible to monitor a large area with fixed stations. But if we combine fixed uh, with mobile, I guess we can be more efficient on, on monitoring large areas. The project itself is complex and it includes uh, many other uh, issues regarding the communication and the decision making on when one technology asks for the help of another one. But basically it's, you know, optimizing monitoring. So we would maybe populate the area of interest with more sensors that can be deployed by drones, but only when something relevant happens, you know. That's the idea. Then the drone can collect the sensor or the drone can deploy an unmanned ground vehicle in the area to gather soil samples, for example, or a boat to gather um, water samples. So it's about combining the different technologies available to, to better monitor an area. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I think we're running up on time now. We need to leave enough uh, we need to leave enough space for people to have breaks to go have their lunch before the next session. Um, it was a bit of a mad dash towards the end there. Um, but great that there's been so many questions coming in through the mural, mural sorry, and both the chat. So again, panellists, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to, to try and respond to them in the chat if you can. Um, and then also for everybody to get involved with the mural, which I'm now very aware of. Um, I think one of our technical team will be resharing the link to that at the start of every session. And we're hoping that they can kind of explode and become quite a quite a fantastic resource and sort of place of discussion in a kind of slightly unorthodox manner. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to all four of you. I, I really enjoyed your presentations and I think it was a really a sort of really fruitful discussion at the end, um, even if we were pressed for time. And Naomi's going to share her screen in a second. There we go. And we're all going to be reconvening, I believe, uh, at four o'clock British Standard Time. So Thank you very much and I'll, I'll see you all in, in 25 minutes.